Ladies and gents, welcome to another live edition of the Highbury Squad. It's Lockdown Series, Episode 15. We go back inside the dressing room, this time with an ex-rival player who may have rolled some of you up, but we love him. He's one of our favourites. <laughs> Okay, happy Friday evening in the UK. Happy morning here in beautiful Southern California and happy somewhere in the middle, wherever you may be in the rest of the world. Joining me on today's podcast is PG Princess Guna. Welcome, Amanda. Hey. Hey, Amanda. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We also Ooh. have uh, Super Kev, who's made another dash to Spain to cover La Liga this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, everybody? Good to have you on, Jace, I've got to say. Uh... And one of our favourite friends of the show, um, you know, I know that he uh, he rubs some <laughs> Arsenal fans up the wrong way, Tottenham fans too. In fact, any opposing <laughs> fan to Chelsea, welcome to the show, Talk Sports Sports Bar, Mr. Jason Pundy. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. How are oh, you? We are good. We are good. How are you surviving good. lockdown part two? You're looking lean and fit and young. I'm, I almost I'm hate you, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a shave. That, that's that's the secret. So, uh, no, you get. I've, I've got a bad knee. The knee that that, that retired me essentially, and uh, I can't really do much on the knee. So, I've had to do some sort of working out at home to try and keep the old weight off. Because, as we all know, when footballers retire, there is a tendency to put <laughs> a few pounds on, right? And I don't want to be one of those guys. I was one of those guys, but we've all seen Razor Runner, right? So <laughs> he's the first person that came into my mind. By the way, you guys. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, my God. Great stuff. Well, look, our Inside the Dressing Room series, this is the second one. We did the first one with a good friend of yours, too, Jay, Mickey Gray, who says yeah. hi, by the way, um, from last week's show. And we love to get players connected with KC to just go beyond the rhetoric of the games and, you know, analysing games. There's so many. There's so many games um, throughout the season. So doing something a little bit different like this that goes down the nostalgia route for us is something we love to do. I'm going to kick I'm going to kick it off and then I'll I'll just it just happens organically from here. But one of the things that I've heard you talk about a lot on the sports bar with Andy, whose hair by the way has grown exponentially. I don't oh, know don't what you're going to do about that. No. <laughs> okay, I won't. I'll keep it quiet. Uh but I love hearing you because Casey similarly who used to go and watch the <clears> Arsenal <throat> Jay uh, and stood in the stands as a young man and you stood in I think it was the shed end with your dad. And then you go on to wear the shirts. Take us yeah. back to where it all began. Um, why Chelsea? Obviously, your dad. And then you're standing in the stands and you fall in love with this club. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm of the opinion you don't get to choose who you support. It, it comes from father to son. I've got three boys. Um, my eldest, two, 26 and 20. Chelsea crazy. My young six-year-old now, he's now being literally force-fed. Right, there is there is no way he's supporting anyone else. I think any father who supports, I know you hear this, right? That an Arsenal dad and his son turns out to sport Spurs. Someone's got to explain how that happens. I don't, I don't get it. And I, you've got to get into them early and make sure that no other family member can can infiltrate and, and get into them. But my dad was a Chelsea fan, and um, he had me in a Chelsea baby grow within six months. I, I, the, I was born six months before we won the FA Cup in 1970. This photograph, that's what my Twitter is of me uh, wearing a Chelsea hat at, at that age. So that it goes back that far. Um, and my dad took me for my, in 1976 uh, for my either sixth or seventh birth set, can't work it out. Uh, I went to go and see Chelsea play Charlton. It was on a, a Wednesday night or Tuesday night. And um, we won 2-1. And that, uh, that that from that day, I remember walking up the steps. Uh, we were in the um, in the East End, and walking up the steps and seeing this big, huge piece of grass under floodlights. And as a young kid, it just blew me away. You know, it just it, you can't believe the size of a pitch looking down from the stands as a young kid. And um, and from that moment on, was just you know. And I'm still the same. I still climb those same steps when I do Chelsea TV, and I still get the same. Feeling, and I think of my dad. He's he's, he's ninety two now. Um, oh wow! You know, God bless. Yeah, and I still think you know that those those same steps. I climbed kind of pretty much. I can't remember exact entrance, but it was the pitch that I looked at that time. It's very similar to what I look at now when I go and do when I work for the club. So you 
I think going back to 1976 to where I am now, it's, it's still doing it. It's quite remarkable. I still, it's like a second home for me. Love it. Absolutely brilliant. You know, um, it's for us as fans to hear you guys talk about this stuff. It's kind of like such a joy because it also brings you back to something that, you know, sometimes people think footballers don't have a heart or they don't have a story. They don't have a life. And really they do in KC. I want to know, like, early on in your career, or did you and Jay meet? Did you play against each other? Do you have... <laughs> it's just <laughs> already, Amanda. <laughs> Obviously, they did then. <laughs> Listen, you two, I think you know something. You and this man here used to play against each other all the time. And we used to battle. And I mean, battle. Long there time. Was times where Jason got the better of me, I've got to tell you, he got the better of me. And there was times where I got the better of him. And he had a he had a sidekick in David Lee with him. And we used to battle. And do you know what? After the game finished, we all got along. There was never any animosity. We'd kick lumps out of each other on the pit. Loved it. And, yeah. And and Jason is one of the, one of the good guys. I could tell you that one. He is one of the good ones. Truthful. Well, um, Casey, you talk to us a lot about who was in the dressing room for you from from a young age and stuff like that. And I've got some names here so you guys can correct me, but a really good friend of our show, and I know someone that Jay adores as well, Mr. Frank Sinclair. He may be one of the best <laughs> dress men in football, actually. He'll rival your dicky bow, Casey. You got, <laughs> I think you mentioned David Lee, um, Eddie Newton, and then the current uh, Chelsea assistant manager, or was he too young? Jody Morris, was he too young? What did you, Jay? Did with you, me, with yeah, me, yeah. With no, we, young, we right? never. Jody was at the club um, as a young schoolboy. I don't remember Jody at the club when I was at, when I was there, but he came through not long after. But um, but you're right. It, it, there was a conveyor belt. I, I think looking back, Arsenal and Chelsea. I think probably you, you you think about how many young lads come through just before Kevin I as well. You know, you got Merce, you got Rocky. You, uh, there's a number of lads that, that that come through before as well, and there was that as well. We 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 had Keith Jones that, that came through to Dublin, Gareth Hall. Yeah. So we had a great. I mean, the rivalry between Chelsea and Arsenal was was awesome. I mean, absolutely awesome. And um, you're right, Kevin. And I go back. I mean, I was uh, I joined Chelsea as an 11 year old. Um, I don't know what you how old you joined Arsenal, Kev, but I remember playing you as a 14, 15 year old. So you, so what you how old yeah, you joined true. Arsenal? So, so Kev, that's how far we go back. We go back to like early teens, maybe even before that, into the youth team, and they were epic battles. I mean, you, you know, you knew you, you had to get your tin hat on playing against Kevin. That 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 was for sure. But, but we used to go because we used to play against one another, and then we used to go to college together every that's Wednesday right. at, at King's Cross, and it was always a little bit odd because they're the Arsenal boys. And the Chelsea boys, and we had to go. We had to do this every Wednesday, or pretty much every Wednesday. And um, you know, we're Chelsea over there, Arsenal, and, and we got on okay. There was never any problems whatsoever. But it was always a little bit like they're Arsenal, right? They're Arsenal over there. And yeah, you know, <laughs> there was but, but, there, but was there was never a, there was never any um, there was never any fall. No, not at all. No, I don't remember there ever being any trouble with at college and. Um, I think we pretty much got on very, very well. But like, like Kev said, when the youth team games come around and the resi games, as it was back then, and eventually first teams, they were, you know, they were what they were. What were you studying? Sorry, Amanda, I know you were <laughs> going to jump in, but don't you want to know what they were studying? What is this malarkey? Well, if you remember, Jay, our teacher was Kate Howie. Kate Howie, that's right, yeah. Oh, really? That's right. It's Kate Howie, the Labour MP, yeah. Kate's a big, big gooner. That's right. She, yeah, yeah, she yeah. is. Yeah. So we thought we were, you know, we'd get we'd get privilege and we got none. We got none. The Arsenal boys got no privilege. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, she's just like on the Chelsea you. boys. So, you know, that brought well, us she's... down to earth with a bump kind of thing. It she's was, lovely. Uh, Kev, was she stricter on you then? You know, actually, what we were learning, we were learning mm. different stuff like life skills and all different stuff. Even, you know, where there's all these um, place settings and forks and knives and spoon, you know, even oh. that, for Princeton, I, a fork <laughs> and a knife. So it was like the it Princess Diaries meets you know, I mean, um, a spoon. A... But it was, you know, working away from the outside in and this was a, uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. Casey, Casey, can, can you, you hear us? 
Sorry. <laughs> Put your ear Put thing your ear, in. Maybe well, your I, earphones back in. I, I know. know. This is I the know. problem we had last week when you're on the road. Yeah, mate, you, okay. asked, you asked what, what we learned, what we, yeah. what we learned at college. Kev's done well. I, I, well, I, I, that's what I said over to you, Kev. I can't remember what we learned. There was, there were, I don't even, do we have homework, Kev? What, what did we do? What, what no, was, no what, homework. We'd never be homework. Was, so what, what was that? What did we do there then? It's I mean, hilarious. I used to, go there. I used to go there. I mean, from memory, we used to have a great laugh and mess about. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember anything I took from there. I hope Kate doesn't watch this. She'll be very no, disappointed. Okay. Uh, again, no. <laughs> That's hilarious. Did it? Was she stricter on you because you were Arsenal? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I bet. Yes. I she might be. And, and you know what? I think that came from Pat Rice, Terry Murphy, and, and Steve Birchall. I'm telling you, <laughs> don't let them get away with anything. And I don't know if you've seen the pictures, because Jason's right, there was a, a massive rivalry even before us, before the year. So you had Michael Thomas and uh, Tony Adams, Rocky, and then you had all the Chelsea boys as well. And there's a big picture of all of them together. You know, it was it was it was crazy. It was crazy, but the Chelsea Great boys fun. got treated Great better fun. than us. Yeah. So, Jace, can I ask you a question? Go ahead, go for it. So, very interesting what you said at the beginning about the fact that you don't understand how children of fathers that support one team um, mm. don't uh, support another. No, no, no. I'm a hundred percent with you. <clears throat> and when I meet people that have got children that they're West Ham and their children are Tottenham. I can't get it through my head, Bad especially parents. the rivalry. Bad yeah, parents. yeah, I always say They're that. Dreadful parents. I, I, <laughs> absolutely. My son doesn't like football, but if he's asked, he'll say Arsenal. That's it. Yeah. He just doesn't right. like football. Right. But I've all, you know, people don't get me though, because when I go, what do you mean you support Arsenal and your son supports West Ham? Uh, what, 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 well, I can't force them. Oh, no, my dad forced us. I wasn't even born and I was in an Arsenal grow. That, that was it. My whole family are Arsenal. But I just want to jump on slightly because I've got to go soon. But Okay. How then? Okay, because I've always wondered this question. You are staunch Chelsea, 100% Chelsea blood. You yeah. then went and played for Spurs. I mm. don't get that. now. Bad, bad, bad day, that one. <laughs> I don't get how you could walk in that dressing room, put a Tottenham top on, when you are so blue blood for Chelsea. Because I've got friends that I often say, like, a friend of mine's son was going to be a goalkeeper for Everton, but they're right. mad Liverpool. Yeah. And I'm like, how will you, how when Liverpool play Everton, yeah. will you want Liverpool to win, but your son's in goal? They said, it's a job. It's just a job. Yeah. But, I mean, you've dragged that. You've dragged that question out, and it's, I'm sweating now, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, look, it's it is a job. That's it. Ultimately, it, it is a job. And I never thought I'd ever see the day that I'd ever leave Chelsea. I was there as an 11 year old kid, um, and you come through, and that was my. It was my second home. I was probably there some days, sometimes as an apprentice when you stand the training ground, you used to go back to the, the ground and do your duties, you'd clean the, the, the changing room, you'd clean the boots, and you would spend probably more time either going to work on the way to work, at work than you would at home. And that was my second home. Um, I, I was sold ultimately. that I had no real say in it. And back then, footballers didn't have the power or the control that they do now. It was a very different kind of place. And I had signed a four-year contract at the club six months earlier and it was literally a bolt out the, out the blue. I had a phone call from me in Porterfield and just basically told me, not asked, told me that I'd been sold. And it's as a 21-year-old as a kid, it, it, or 22, I can't remember, I was there or there, but your world is literally turned upside down. And I, the way I saw it is that the, the club made their choices and their decisions and then I, I, I then had to make mine. I... I that was it. You've gone, and it was it was a it was a very odd time for me because I never thought the day would come, and if it was ever going to come, I didn't see it coming as as, as early as it did. Mm. And you know, you have to move on. And, and when I left, I, I, I then was a Spurs player, and that that my you know I then gave what I what my all to Spurs. That 
that's how it is. You, you put the shirt on. You know, when you're younger, you play for lots of different teams. You play for county, the district. Mm. As a young kid, I was at Arsenal, believe it or not. When, when I was uh, when I was really young, as a as a as a as about a twelve year old, I was at Arsenal. I was at I went to West Ham for a period. I was at Ch as at Wimbledon. I was at Crystal Palace. And so you do actually go and play for other teams, and you know, and and but even so, the point you make is good. Well, I, it, they, I was sold ultimately. And, so and did Ken you Bates. not? You don't get a say of where you go. You are sold, and that is it. Back then, no, I, I, it was you're gone, you're sold. And I, I, I asked him Porterfield because back then, this is my first question to him. I said, if I don't go, would I be put in the reserves? He said, and here, this is what he said: not if I have any say. And the fact that he said wow. he couldn't say to me, he couldn't get, and, and that's what happened back then. You get you mm. because you think of the wages that were on back then, right? Good money by most standards, but the money you you can't have a, a player on sixty grand playing for the Reds. I mean, look at Deli Ali at Spurs right now, right? He can't get into the first team. Mm. Okay, he's on a huge salary. Mm. Players like that, and uh, you know, Oza at, at, at Arsenal, you can't back then. You could afford to perhaps have one or two players that weren't on huge salaries that 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 they're upset in the apple cart and they 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 could go and train with the stiffs as that's what we used to call them right and that was my concern that Ken Bates would say force him out of the club and and um, you know those they're very different from today's times. Wow, it's really crazy because mostly in a corporate job, okay, you can you can leave a job and try and find another one. It, it's rare that people get asked to you know leave. In these times, of course, it's a little bit different. In, in American sports, you know, a good friend of the show, Billy Bean, who the the movie Moneyballs um, after, we talk about it a lot with him, is, you know, plays are commodities, and they truly are yeah. in the NFL and MLB. They're treated as commodities and, and stuff like that. And we're seeing that more in the modern, the modern game. So I can't imagine how hard it is to just be at a place that you love so much and Casey experienced the same thing. New manager. No, I was going to ask in. Kev. Yeah, I was ask Kev, it's the same thing happened. To you, eventually you left. I mean, how was that for you when when you were you were there as a, as a small child growing up, and eventually first team, and then what happened with you? Well, my contract ran out, and obviously it was the end of the George Graham era, and you, you know what it's like, Jay. When you're in the dressing room, everybody gets along. It, it, it's a, it's a it's a place of comfort and power, and then the 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 head of it goes, which is George Graham. And then you start seeing cracks in it. And um, Stuart who's the over. I got to the end of my contract. Um, and Bruce Riock, I went to meet Bruce Riock. And that, that meeting must have lasted about five minutes because uh, I, met him. Oh. I didn't like him at all. Right. And he, he was telling me what you're going to sign and this is where you're going to play. And I was like, right. <laughs> Crazy! I just, I just, I'm not shook his hand. I said, "Thank you very much, but I'm going to be moving on." But what happened to you happened to me at Nottingham Forest, right? Where do you remember Irving Scholar, who was Spurs chairman? Yes. He then became chairman of Nottingham Forest, and we just got promotion. Myself and Pierre Van Oydong, we we were the highest goal scoring partnership in Europe. We scored sixty odd goals. And I got a call on the Friday. I was supposed to sign a new contract two weeks before. Kept getting put off, kept getting put off. Got to the Friday. I got told, accepted it for me. And it is in my best interest to take right. it. Right, okay. That is it. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm you don't have any say, you're out of here. That so now it. it's not like that, is it? <laughs> well... well the players uh, are on such huge salaries now yeah. that they can afford to say, do you know what? No. No, I'm, no, no. I'll do what I want to do. Gareth That's what Bale, doing. Point, and yeah. those are the, the two, yeah. you know, two very good examples of, of we'll, we, we can, and they can afford to mm. sit there and not go, into, if you're picking up 150, 200, 300, 400, whatever thousand pounds a week, you're not going to be that bothered, are you? If you're not, you know, certainly, certainly, look, okay, let me rephrase that. Yes, you're going to be bothered because you're not playing football, but the financial impact that it's having on your life and it's the detriment to the football club. And also, we'll maybe talk about this in a second, you wonder whether the Ozil thing is still a bit of a hangover at Arsenal right now with Arteta. It becomes a problem for, for, for the club. 
it becomes a problem for the club. So, yeah, they they had all the power back. And, and not just not just Ozil, but look at Sogradis. He ended up choosing to stay. He's on like one twenty a week. Kalasinac, he's on what one ten. Mustafi. I mean, two of those players at least had potential deals to move to um, everyone, and they didn't because where are they going to get that money? And it doesn't matter. Like people talk about, oh, how much is enough? Well. You set, you set your li life up a certain way to live a certain lifestyle and it becomes fundamental to you what you're earning at the club. And if you're going to move to Napoli, who want to pay you just 40 or 50 grand a week, that's a huge lifestyle change. Just to, just to swing back real quick before we move too far forward, we always talk about in the dressing room, Jay, this being a sanctuary for players, a place where you know, you can all kind of sit and talk and whatever stays there. It's like Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in mm. Vegas uh, <laughs> type of thing. Now with social media and the modernization of the game, so yeah. much gets out. Arsenal have experienced that during the international break, the David Luiz Ceballos fight. There's a few things that have been going on and you rightly point out in terms of maybe, you know, where, where Arteta's Arsenal is right now in terms of camaraderie and closeness. When you were in the dressing room, who was the who was the most influential player that put his arm around you and taught you some lessons? Where, let's Paul start Elliot. there. Paul Elliott was was just brilliant with me because oh, wow. um, yeah, he was. It, I was very young and, and I'd just broken into the first team before he arrived, and I thought because they had Erling Johnson there, and I thought and Ken Moncow, I, I I thought that what would happen is that I would be pushed back down the pecking order. Um, and that turned out to be the, the, the complete opposite. It was me and Paul that played together, and he was uh, absolutely brilliant. I mean, he he, um, he came with a, with a massive experience of a background that he played out in Italy, and I remember him as a young kid because I was a football crazy where, where he started off. Uh, he was at Luton. I remember him, him there. Um, then he went, of course, to Celtic, and that's where we bought him from. And, you know, you think about the, his background that he'd had and the experience that he'd had. But the influence he had on me was his leadership skills that that, um, that I think we, we, the only way I can kind of liken it, I suppose, is is a little bit like the transformation to what Van Dijk, in a similar way, his leadership at the back, talking, organisation, constantly, constantly, you know, encouragement the whole time. And even in the training ground, off the pitch, and I, it, we became really good friends as well. So, it's not even a difficult question for me to answer, quite, quite frankly, Paul Elliott, without any doubt at all. He was brilliant to me. And he's having a big influence on the game now, isn't he, Paul, with the work that he's doing at the FA? And I think you know we need more voices like his. He's so perfect. Let me tell you now, knowing from what I know and what I've just said to you, he's absolutely perfect. And I, I, I when I see Paul, Kev, you, you must know. Paul as as well. You must see him in the circles. I just Mark love being Paul, in his yeah. company as well. And he's yeah, he's a he's he's a he's a he's a great boy. I love I love got a lot a lot of time, a lot of respect for Paul. Jay, we often talk about um, yeah. you know dressing rooms where some players like it quiet, some players like it noisy. Some players <clears throat> kind of you know do the big old team talk and stuff like that. Tell us a little bit about the, the difference in going from the Chelsea dressing room to the Tottenham dressing room because, you know, for That's us... That's what like I was going to say. Job, yeah. job to job, it's not easy. You go on your first day and you're like, oh, my God, what have I done? You feel like you've made the biggest mistake of your life. Can you talk us through a little bit mm -hmm. about that transition? Um, and then, you know, because Casey had to kind of go through the mm -hmm. same when he left Arsenal <clears throat> as well. Yeah, so obviously being at the club as an 11-year-old right through, I, I knew everyone. I knew... I knew that ground inside out. I knew everything that was to know about that football club. Um, and then you go into a totally different environment that is so different. It's similar because the setup, there's a training ground, the lads sit in the, you know, there's, there's a treatment room and all, but it, it, it was just so alien. It, it, it was, mm. it was like walking into a, di a different life and, it was very odd, and, and Spurs at the time it was Peter Shreves that was the manager. Terry Venables was at the club, and Shreves went the following season, and um, Doug Livermore and Ray Clements then took over the, uh, over the race. There was quite a lot of change. I went late in the season in March, and then the following season, ninety two, the first year of the Premier League, there was a lot of change. And the Razor Rudder come in, um, Darren Anderton come in, one or two other players arrived at the club as well. So there was quite a bit of change at the time, but it. it it took a while for me to to adjust. In fact, I'm not even quite sure that I ever really fully did 
adjust to be honest because at the time I spent and it was it was a bad time for me at Spurs uh, injuries just decimated the time there I didn't play well when I got in the team and then I couldn't stay fit and so on and so forth so it was, it was a very it, it there was nothing smooth about it at all from from pretty much it was a bumpy ride and, and injuries kept me out the team and then you know time after time then the, the managerial changes it was so it it, it was a very odd it, there was no, it, it wasn't smooth. I, I see some players that go into 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 clubs, that come into clubs. The, the, the transition is literally like that. They hit the ground and then things just go from strength. That was not the case for me from Spurs. And um, but I'm, a, I'm a, no, I got on with everyone. I didn't have a problem with the dressing room. I'm not a shy retiring type. Um, but just things it never really kind of clicked for me at Spurs. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I was going to say that actually. Go into another dressing room. Yeah. It must be different, hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Go on, Kev. <clears throat> what I want to, I want to ask you because obviously there's a lot of people who's going to be watching <laughs> who have never moved clubs, and although, as you said, there's a training ground, there's a dressing room, there's a treatment table, the same sort of stuff. Yeah. I, I just want you to let people know how different, even different training with different players in a different club, the different mindset that you have to have because you knew everything at Chelsea. Now you move to a, a, a different yeah. club. Yeah. Everything, it is everything, isn't it? It's, it's alien. It, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to think how different it can be, but it is. Every ground, every training ground is different the way the setup is every club is different and um at the time peter shreves was there and i like pete but the, 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 there was a there was a lot of problems at spurs at the time and there was a number i'm not going to name names but there was a lot of players there oh go on there were that were that were, <laughs> that, were, that, were that were taking they were taking liberties basically and i was shocked when i've from coming from chelsea going into that where the manager was respected. Things were respected. There was that. There was a. They just seemed to go into Spurs at that time, and that people, players, big name players, they were taking liberties in training. They were taking liberties around the training. I was a little bit like, oh, I can't believe. Yeah. And I never seen anything. You're shocked. I'm You're like, shocked. I'm like, yeah. I can't. And, and and Spurs at that time, like, this is. They knew who they were. The management and they knew they knew they had to they had to get rid. Of, they knew there had to be a restructuring system. But the, Peter Shreve had very little respect from the players from memory. Um, Interesting. And I and I I felt sorry for him actually because and everyone went, everyone knew he was going to leave at the end of the season even though nothing was mm. nothing was official. It never one knew and the the lack of respect from a number of of, of people at, at the club was quite quite shocking actually um but like i said it, it's you've got to get on with these you've got to deal with these things and i was only young i was only 22 um and it was it was an eye-opener for me that i thought every club was run like chelsea i thought this was how it was going to be and you know and not to say that chelsea's the perfect yeah. football club and the way things are done i'm not saying but it, it was i thought it, it was it was substandard from whatever the training ground everything at, 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 at that time but um but when you think when players move between clubs, okay, the biggest one for us was Sol Campbell from Tottenham to Arsenal. Yet he seemed to settle in really well, like he'd always been there, like he'd never been Tottenham's captain. That must have been not not like easy, can it? I mean, he was Tottenham's captain walking into Arsenal's dressing room. But, but yeah, he, he fitted in so well. As well. It, when yeah, he, 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 he walked in. He walked. He walked into a good team, right? And I think that that changed. That, that there's, there's lots of different. So you didn't. You didn't walk into a good team, did well, you? Well, well, well. Spurs at the time were at the wrong end of the table. Spurs were. Spurs weren't. They, they were in the bottom half of the table when when yeah. I when I joined Spurs. I seem to remember back back in ninety one, ninety two. Sorry, um, but look, Sol is Sol is a. He's a brilliant footballer. Was a brilliant footballer, um, and he probably left at a time where his career needed to a step up, mm. needed to go up. And let's be honest, mm. uh, from our, from Spurs to Arsenal is a step up. There, there is no Absolutely. doubt about that, and was proven that, and he made the yeah. right decision. And you know, I, I will always on Talksport, I'll always defend footballers because football clubs 
will treat players if they can get away with it like a piece of dirt. Yeah. They will. And mm-hmm. and you know, they, they absolutely will. And I will always stick up for players because I know the other side and I know and people talk about loyalty about footballers, right? And the people talk about about how players players aren't loyal. Let me tell you now, football clubs aren't loyal. Yeah. And and, and it works both ways. And if you want a player to be loyal, you pay that player to be loyal. That you know, that's that's the transaction. Let's let's have it right. You want a you want that footballer, you pay him. If you don't pay him enough, he's not going to be loyal to you. That's that's how football works in my in my eyes. Um, and Sol Campbell wanted up wanted an upgrade in his career, and that is exactly what he got. Look at the medals he won. Look what he went on to go and achieve. Was it the right decision? No doubt about it. Without question, it was the right. Hundred percent. I just want to digress real quick and stay in the uh, dressing uh, room. Uh, go on, Katie. Yeah. Can, on, I, Katie. can I add to that? Absolutely. Can I add to that? I, I think the the opposite kind of what happened to Jason happened to Sol where Jason left a good structure at Chelsea and went into Tottenham. And Tottenham weren't quite there. You know, there was a, a bit of disrespect for the manager and there were, there were too many moving parts at Spurs to, for it to be settled. So Campbell left Spurs and came into an Arsenal, which was structured, functioning, Absolutely. a good team. He could just slot in, didn't have to be anything other than himself, and he could just get out of it. The team was, yeah. they were world-class players in there. You know, it was just, he just needed to come in and perform. And as long as he yeah. performed, hey, listen, there's players around me who can do the business. Absolutely. So yeah. let me yeah. let me ask you both this, because um, I want to stay in the dressing room, but bring it a little bit forward before we go back again, because it's kind of topical in terms of what you guys are talking about. And I don't want to bring the O word, but I'm going to. Is it possible that, a, a player like Meza Ozil, even though he's been ostracized from the first team by the manager and look at the Gwenduzi situation who was sent on loan, both for, you know, so-called bad behavior, you know, Willian gets to go to Dubai and doesn't really get reprimanded in any way and actually gets picked to play. Jay, I'll start with you. Is it, yeah, go on. do players get pissed off about that stuff? Is it possible that that could be upsetting the Arsenal dressing room right now when you look at maybe a lacklustre Lacazette, a lacklustre Aubameyang, a Trump Sorry, you have to repeat the question. I, I'm shocked you said the word piss there. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I was on talk sport, I was expecting someone to dump it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we, uh, we push the boundaries here. We push the boundaries. <laughs> and you and Andy would love <laughs> it. <laughs> Get on, you Can we go, Kev? <laughs> yeah. You can go far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go as far as Sorry, you want. So. Sorry, 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 sorry. Ask again. Sorry, is it possible that you know it's upset the the dressing room in a sense because I'm sure there are pl- some players that we follow the team. There are some players that like Ozil, some that don't. The dressing room is a very calming, sacred place. Is it possible that perhaps some of these moves that Arteta's made, showing favoritism <laughs> to some and not others, does affect players? Okay, so if we go back to Arteta's first um, first games, he played Ozil, um, and I think he gave him a, a, a run out. I think he, you know, he proved to me you're good enough to be in this team. I actually think it's the right call not to have Ozil in the team because Ozil, for me, I think was was um, if you look back at Wenger's final years at the club, I think if you had to really encapsulate what was about Arsenal at that time. I think you could, if you looked at Ozil, that that for me really did encapsulate what Arsenal were at that time, mm-hmm. and they were they were going nowhere fast. And Ozil, I, I felt that to to give him the contract they did at the time was was wrong, and I said that he was never worth the money they did. Arsenal wanted to appear strong and give them and give a contract. How would it have looked externally to have to have let Sanchez go and Ozil at that same time? It would not have looked good. And I think the club kind of put themselves in a position. They had to make a call and they made the wrong call because they've given him a thick end of £350,000 a week, um, who's now, that, that is now a, 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 a huge weight around the club's neck. So, so I okay, digress slightly, but going back to what the, the question you're asking about Ozil's impact on this, when Arsenal aren't playing well, it becomes, he's a bit of a shadow. I don't remember anyone talking about Ozil 
when the FA Cup was lifted, the Community Shield, and Arsenal started the season quite well. I don't remember him talking about that. And the problem you've got is that I think it's above Arteta now. The club have got to move him on. They've got to move him on. Pay him up. Pay his contract. Thank you very much. Good night and move on. Because all the time he's there and Arsenal are going through a real sticky patch at the moment, mm-hmm. people, and I get callers phoning up saying, bring Ozil back. And I'm like, no, 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 no. O- now, Ozil is not going to, he's not the solution. He might be a little bit of a problem behind the scenes, but he's certainly Correct. not the solution right now to Arsenal's problems. But. but you've got to pay him up, move him on, do the deal, get rid of him. He's got a year left in his contract, or less than that year. Now, thank you and get rid of that cloud. But he might be the solution for right now because apart from last night, Jason, <clears throat> we are dire. We lack creativity. Stop that, Kev. We lack creativity. Mm. We can't even score in open play. So no. for me, if you've got a player that <laughs> is is earning three hundred and twelve thousand pounds a week, then play him and see what he can give. That's all I'm saying. I know the other two completely disagree with me, and I know you do. But he is not going until next May. He won't. He's just there. So use him. It's not as though we're like doing any great shifts at the moment. Honestly, Jason, you can't make a, 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 a bad situation worse. Go on, we Jay. need some cre- creativity. And I'm sorry, he's not a bad player. There's no. So here's the problem. Here's the, here's the problem. You see, he's. This is the cloud I'm talking about, and you've illustrated it perfectly you're thinking like that a lot of the fan base are thinking mm. like that the performances haven't been brilliant the results have gone a little bit skew with and all of a sudden Ozil sitting at home twiddling his thumbs on Twitter while the game's going on who by the way I think is being very mischievous and that's of being course. kind yeah. we know what he's um, doing yeah yeah and, 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 and I look if he is the answer if he is the answer what does that say right now about Arsenal Football Club? What does it say about well, Arteta's decision? What does it say about what does it say about where Arsenal are? I I, 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 don't know what the question is. If it, because if the question, if the answer, if the question is we're not, there's not enough creative, we're not scoring goals. But when he was in the team, was he answering those questions for you? Well, he wasn't doing too bad at the beginning of the season, but all I'm saying is at the moment, of course, we wouldn't be talking about him if we were scoring and we had creativity. Actually, my original question was Uh, whether or not someone like him earning 350 grand a week doing polls from his couch on a Saturday when everyone's grafting and traveling to God knows what places in Europa League, does that bother them as players in the dressing room or do they let it go? Well, this is a dip, Kev. I mean, you know, you and I grew up in a different era. It, I'm, my, my, my gut feeling is, oh, God, that's a good question. Would it bother me? Um, it would probably bother me. A, I don't know because for, generally when people talk about fallings out, if someone wants to leave a football club and a player leaves, I never really had a problem with them. If they want to leave and they want to further their career, I don't think ever, and Kev, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I never felt that if a player wanted to leave or was unhappy with the club, I never felt it was letting me down. It's his career. I mean, what? he's got to do what he's got to do, look after his career. I, and if I was always in the dressing room, I'd get on with him. I would speak to him. I'd, I'd talk to him. I've got no issue with him as a as as a person. I, I, it's difficult because with not having Twitter when we played or how it was done, it, it's hard to answer that. But I, my instincts are, no, I wouldn't have an issue with him. Guys, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Um, Jason, it's been lovely chatting with you. Have Enjoy a lovely Christmas. The- oh. Thank you. Enjoy the show, everyone. I'll see you Thank all soon. You. Take care. Thanks. Bye. 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 Everybody knew if a, if a player was having a, was a bit of loggerheads with the club, the dressing room would kind of look after them a little bit better, I think. But where it is now, everybody seems to be a bit disjointed. Meza Erzul is doing what he wants because he can do it. And to, if that was us, Jay, when we were playing, I think a player wouldn't do to undermine because it looks like he's undermining the, the actual team. Oh, he would, he, without you know question, he is. If, if a player was out there, if, if, if a player was out there back in our day putting things in the press that could be detrimental to our team, 
that will get sorted out in the dressing room day. Kev, did you, do you think that the fact that he's on such a huge salary as well, that must change things, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, 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 he holds all the cards, doesn't he? 100%. He's got, he's got all the cards here. There's, there's, of course. That's of course what I'm saying. It's so, it's so interesting. Jace, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest delay, with you. Go on. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, I honestly believe the club tried to do a deal with Meza Erzo. But the deal, he wanted full payment. But the club wanted to do a deal. Well, Meza well, holds all the cards. He holds all the yeah, aces, he holds all the jokers. Well, do you know so what? There's only it's either you pay him everything. Yeah. It's either yeah. you pay him everything and get him out. Yeah. Or you live with, with you live with what's going on now, and that's what they do. You, you're gonna you're gonna have to have your you're gonna bite the bullet. You're gonna have to take it, and you, it's gonna be painful. It's gonna be eye watering. Pay him up, move him on, because you've got to give Arteta the best chance that he that he can have. Because when there are sticky results, and we're seeing it a little bit at the moment. Everyone's talking about Ozil. Now, get that out of the conversation. Right. That should not be part of the conversation exactly. now. But because he's still at the club, it becomes an, an illegitimate part of yep. the conversation because he's a paid professional footballer at that club, the highest paid mm -hmm. player at the club, um, with a big reputation, a World Cup winner. And there are fans saying, why is he not playing? Well, I, I understand that point of view. Take it out of the equation. He's no longer the future. He's not going to be the future after this season. You owe him that money, whether you like it or not. You're contractually uh, 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 abiding to pay that contract, pay it up, take the pain, move him on, and get the and give Arteta a fair crack of the whip. Okay. Well, that's why I wanted to ask you guys because he annoys us, let alone be earning 350 grand a week. I cover MLS here, you guys, and I've talked about this on the show before. You've had Zlatan and Gerard and Pirlo and Villa and Beckham on six million type dollars. And then there's a guy that plays alongside them that's on 65 grand a week. I mean, as a man, it's got to bother you at some point that someone's just kind of you know, earning that kind of money. And at least they produced and they're, they're legends. And Ozil has produced in his career, but he's definitely not the same player he was. Right, I just want to rewind a little bit and have some fun, Jay. We're already at Go 42 on. minutes. And if you're Go cool, um, I'd love Go to. For it. Okay, Go cool. For it. So we, we talk a lot about what's the worst dump of a stadium you've ever gone and had to play in and deal with a dressing room where they probably flooded it, put ice buckets everywhere for different reasons. <laughs> What's the worst place yeah. ever? That's, that's quite, an e it's quite an easy answer uh, for me. Now, I, I grew up in Wimbledon. That's where I'm from, born and bred. <laughs> um, and I used to go and watch. I used to ball boy at Plough Lane. <laughs> I used to ball boy there as a, as a young, you know, 9, 10, 11 year old kid. And um, I played lots of county games there. I played district games there. Um, and when I eventually went there as a professional, you know, as a kid, you're kind of grateful to be in a, in a dressing room of a professional football club, right? You know, you, you kind of play, I play finals there because that's where I went to school. Um, but when you're a professional footballer and you rock up at Wimbledon, <laughs> let me tell you now, your attitude changes completely. <laughs> it was an absolute... <laughs> I'll say shithole, right? I'm saying that. Can I say that? <laughs> you can. <laughs> Our friend Warren Barton will love listening to that. <laughs> honestly, honestly. But I love the ground. I love the club because that's a, a lot of my childhood as well, you know, when I was there because we used to play uh, district games very early on as a kid. Um, and we'd let we get a free entry there. This was in there in, uh, I don't know, fourth division, third division, wherever wherever they were. You know, get maybe, I don't know, a couple of thousand tops. <laughs> Um, so, so, but yes, th back then, and it was, it had, it had a charm about it. And I'm, I'm delighted they're back as well, back up, back at their spiritual home, back up mm -hmm. there right now. Um, but when you, when you go there as a pro and you go, as I did walking through the marble halls of, of Arsenal, and then you got to go to Plough Lane. <laughs> wow. It, honestly, it literally, like it. you've gone from Champions League down to the, down to the local park. It, it was, it was really bad, but it had its charm crazy stuff all right so what about the most when we ask kc this he says that he wasn't really intimidated by any stadium he went into uh 
was there any stadium like when you walked into the the building going into the dressing room that you were really intimidated by at all yeah. The only one I can think of, the most intimidating atmosphere I played in was Leeds away. And mm. I it, it it was it was it was two things. One, you go well, but two, it excites you. There is a part of that, you're going into a cauldron and look, we got turned over badly. I never won at Leeds. And <laughs> I, I I know, and and but you it there was something about it and I the one thing that really has in this in this this dreadful pandemic that hopefully we're going to be coming out of soon very 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 soon is that Leeds fans because I love their fans. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we all we have that rivalry. Certainly, Chelsea Leeds it goes back to the nineteen seventy FA Cup final. But to Ellen Road, that atmosphere was just brilliant. I loved it. It was intimidating. They were horrible. They were nasty. But wow, it, they're a welcome addition back to the Premier League, and I hope. That we can, um, that we will see what that Leeds atmosphere is like in the Premier League, because I think the Premier League needs to see what Ellen Road is like, and also the away fans, because I was there when um, you guys won't know this. We we got promoted Chelsea back in '83, I think it was. I was there. We beat Leeds five 0 They smashed up the scoreboard, and I remember sparks come flying off the, the last game of the season, um, and uh, and they were horrible, nasty, the, the victor and poison. But you know what? So I bad. Just, I just love it. It's great. that's what. I love going to those grounds when the, when the atmosphere is that tight. Here's one for both of you from Paul Robertson, Casey, on Facebook. What's the angriest you've ever seen a manager get in the dressing room? <laughs> <laughs> Angry, George Graham. Angry. Let me tell you, he was the one. George Graham was the one. Listen, everything went flying, shoes, boots, the skip turned over. <laughs> <laughs> you the, the, where the chalkboard was and all the cops that went just, and you know what he never even said a word to the team that, that's, how, that's how angry he was he never you say, even he said didn't a, word. Say a word you say he just threw his arms and fists around and no words come out of his mouth no and what I'm saying is he, he was swearing he went berserk but he never even said a word to the team he walked out because if he said anything to the team, uh, uh, they were that you could have even played in the second half. Uh, it I was it. Uh, too for sure. And you know, one of the angriest of Sims was going to win. So that tells you everything about it. We beat Sheffield United at Highbury 5 2, and he went absolutely ballistic. He smashed the window and everything. He was only <laughs> perfection. That's what he wanted, he wanted perfection. Man, Arsenal players couldn't say that. Now, what about you, Jay? What was the angriest? Oh, I can't got, imagine got, George Burley getting too angry. No, 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 no. I've got, I've got quite a funny story, actually. As soon as Kev said that about throwing things, we were playing Coventry away. I was at Chelsea. We were playing Coventry away. Bobby Campbell was the manager. And he... We were getting, we, we were shocking. We were getting beat only one nil. It was lucky to be just the one nil. And he's come in, and he is he is throwing his he, he's giving it that as he walks around the dressing room, all of that. And he's he stood there, and it was, look, we were we were expecting it. We got what we deserved. And he's standing there fuming. No one said nothing. And Kev, do you remember the Lucasaid bottles that, that <laughs> they used to drink drink out of? Right, they, they, they'd be the Lucasaids yeah. back back in the day. And um, he's picked up. He's picked up the masseuse's bowl and it's got oil in it. And he's given it one of them, right? And he's spat, he's drunk oil. <laughs> he's, he's got the wrong bottle. And he's, he's oh, literally no. the rest, And he's, he's spat oil all over them. The, he's, uh, 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 oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, oh, you can we just had an absolute bollock, bollo yeah, bollock him. And he, he's just drunk a load of oil. And we sat there. I was only young going, what do I do? I'm looking around for a reaction. How do I react? That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's gone, it's gone from absolute. Keep quiet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keep quiet. <laughs> Jay, can you remember the best ever team talk or player? I remember I was saying to Casey and Mickey that. John Terry and Frank Lampard said one of the best ever speeches they've heard was from Scotty Parker, actually. 
not from um, Jose or Carlo or any of the other Chelsea managers. Can you remember <coughs> a speech or a time in the dressing room where a player just or a manager just totally blew you away? Um, nothing really springs to mind, to be honest. Um, I, I think there are there are certain players. I mean, you mentioned Scotty Parker there. There are certain players that I used to look up to. Paul Elliott. I'm going to go back to Paul again. In in, in big games, we played in a in a in a, in a league cup semi final, um, which we got beaten. Uh, we we played in a in a FA Cup quarter final, which we got beaten. But I, I I always used to look to look around to what to, to to Paul, and Paul was that. That he wasn't a, a tub thumper. He wasn't, you know, it beat your chest. And, and, and but yeah, the, the, I think sometimes as well, it's the words you choose, not necessarily how you say it or how loud you say it, but it, it's it's how you go into certain games. I'm just trying to think now about about but the, how he would make me feel going mm. into those into, into those type of games. And as you further your career, you try to 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 pass on that in in, in big games or, or certainly games that are, that have big importance to to, to some of the the younger players that are, are coming through. But um, I don't remember a, a team to... No, there's nothing that springs to mind, no. So you both can understand. You know, there was some ridicule with Messi's tears over Suarez leaving. And I think that a lot of the times it can be overlooked because, you know, people just think just because a player is one of the best in the world or he earns great money that he doesn't have feelings or emotions. And KC, a lot of people were having a pop at Messi for his tears over Suarez and losing him in the dressing room. But that does matter, doesn't it? Like when you do have a Paul Elliott or like you at <clears throat> Arsenal, all these great players around you, one leaves and it makes a massive difference. But, uh, uh, again, Sophie, the dressing room is such an important part of what happens on the football pitch. Because on the training ground, Everything reverts back to whatever happens. We've seen we've seen scraps going on on the training pitch, and I'm sure Jason's seen many scraps at Chelsea. Yeah, but yeah. it gets with in the dressing room. It's policed by the experienced players and the respected players. The manager obviously deals with the, all the experienced players, and they're the ones who organise if there's a, there's a night out or there's a meal <laughs> or whatever. Everything gets organised by the experience, right? Now, I, I, I don't know how, and this is no disrespect to Unai Emery or anyone, how he could all of a sudden turn around and say there's five captains. There's various players respected in the dressing room, 100%. But for him to come out and say there's five captains, no, this ain't American football. This is, this is Premier League football, English football, top flight. It's those experienced players that set the tempo. If you're not doing it in training as a young player, an, an experienced player is going to let you know. I can guarantee it. Pull your socks up. And I don't know whether that is actually going on up, up in football uh, right now because everybody's crying out for characters. Mm, they've gone. They've left. When you think about, you, you think about what. Okay, here's a, here's a question. The centre, Tony Adams, where where are, where's the next John Terry, Tony Adams in football? There, there's Van Dyke now. There aren't many about. Mm -hmm. you know, those type of, 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 of leading centre-halves are about. I'm trying to think of any more. Cody at Wolves. Vincent uh, Company was probably the last one. Uh, yeah. Puyol at, at Barca. I mean, yeah. Um, Ramos maybe at... at Ramos, where are, Ramos, Ramos Ramos Madrid. Yeah, where, where are they? Where are these? No, no, I think football has changed. I think, Kev, if we were to go into the game now, back with you know, our, our education as young APs, and, the, and, and it was a school of hard knocks. No, make no mistake about yeah. that. It's a school of hard knocks, the survival of the fittest, the banter was brutal, but on the pitch... It, 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 you know, it was it was survival of the fittest. L literally, it, it was that way. And, and I loved and I loved it. it. Made me the person I am today. I don't know whether there is that now. It's a different environment. Which I'm not saying it's it's inferior. I'm not suggesting for one second that it's 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 just. I think it's a, it's a different. We're looking at different footballers now. And and I just I don't know. I don't. I think maybe it would be good. I. I think maybe a Kevin Campbell or Jason Gunny going in at certain clubs, I think actually would add something different 
to the makeup of how football is, is now. I'm not criticising because look, we got a great product, and, and um, yeah, we're very lucky to watch what we watch. What about Jason, do you, do you, Jason, do you think that you know doing the duties and um, um, having a tough school with the first team and even Christmas time, you know, when got to Christmas and you had to you had to sing your song, Jace. Yeah, what song yeah, did yeah, you yeah. sing? <laughs> Careless Whisper. <laughs> yeah, Georgie, no! <laughs> Do you know what, Kev? I, the, 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 the happiest days of my life, the best two, the best two days, of the years, of, sorry, best two years of my life, was when I was an apprentice, and I I made friends for life, and I still speak YTS, to you. Yeah, yeah, my, we're, yeah, we're YTS boys, twenty seven pound fifty a week. Um, and you know they they were good days. They they grounded me for for who I am today, the values I have today, how how hard I still work today, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I think that I think that some of these these younger um, uh, you know, scholars, as they're called now, they have missed yeah. out on a certain part of, of their education, but they get it in a different way. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying ours was better. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just saying they get it in a different way. Now they they educate themselves with computers on on tactics, style of play, formations, set pieces, pattern, all all of these things, which is vital to a football. You can argue maybe that that maybe these lads needed it more than what we did: painting the stand, clearing the dressing rooms, cleaning boots. Yeah. You can argue, you can make the argument. But I tell you now, I wouldn't change a thing, Kev. Wouldn't change a thing. It was the best days of my life. Me neither. Me neither. There's a lot. There's a lot Absolutely to be said brilliant. about what you guys had to do as well. I know that, you know, the modern game comes with a different set of stress and pressure. There's no doubt about that. You are on, You the whole world is watching you. If you're Marcus Rashford, you're yeah. dealing with all of these great things you're doing off the pitch, but what counts and where you're going to be criticised is what happens on the pitch. You know, Arsenal uh, Football Club right now, you know, Kevin and I go back about this with the FA Cup, but we're going to be judged about how we progress in the Premier League. That's how Arteta is going to be judged. These players are under an insurmountable amount of pressure. Whether they feel the pressure, Jay and Casey, that's mm -hmm. another thing. I feel when I watch certain players at certain clubs that they feel the pressure. You play for Pep Guardiola, you're feeling that pressure every week. You play for Jurgen Klopp, you're feeling that pressure. And I'm hoping that Mikel Arteta is changing the DNA and the culture of Arsenal and that our players are starting to feel that pressure in the Premier League, in the dressing room, because we don't have a team of characters. We don't come from the cloth that you guys were cut from. Um, they seem a bit entitled and enabled, these Arsenal players. They seem a little bit arrogant. They think that they got the shirt, they got the contract and they've arrived. And I think that's where some modern day, um, that's where maybe our generation, Generation Xers, there's a disconnect a little bit, Jay and Kevin, and I'll, I'll hand it back over to you in terms of the graph that maybe we we saw back in the day versus the entitlement that happens now. That's the toughest part. Go on, Kev. Okay, well, from, uh, this is what I, I've always thought this because when you grow up, at the club, at the at the big clubs, and you make the first team. You have to have a certain mindset in order to play there. Pressure is a part of it. Pressure is part of your growing up being able to handle it. Now I don't care how much money Arsenal or Chelsea or whatever buy you for. When you are when you pay that money, you are paid that money to handle the pressure and perform, regardless. So this is why probably I think based from our area era handled the pressure a lot more homegrown because it was part of it was like dipping. If you are coming for a Chelsea, you are coming for an Arsenal, you're coming for a, it was part of your life. Handling the pressure, being able to pull, perform. You cross that white line, you've got to perform. That is it. And you took the stick. Have you got stick? You took the stick. You again. <laughs> but these players now, if anybody gets stick, it's like they're being they're being hung out to dry. And it's not the case. It is just part and parcel of being at a big club. 
<laughs> yeah, some of the I look I look back and there there was some stuff that I'm look I'm guessing I speak on behalf of Kevin that, that I, there's stories that we couldn't tell but but it, it made me who I am today and we weren't bad lads we were all good lads and we worked hard and we wanted to achieve the goals we did but it was done in a very different way now it, like I said I go back it was the, it was the school of hard knocks you know it, it, it was a it was a different upbringing I'm not saying a better one just a different upbringing and we were there there was it. it I, They've got far more, there are the advantages now coming to the pitches, with the facilities, everything's done for them. You know, I'm not jealous because I, I, I think my life growing up, I, I had it in a, I prefer mine because it was just banter with the lads. If the, every day you come home, your cheeks hurting because you were laughing so much. But you, you went, yeah. yeah, you'd go, you'd do the boots together. You'd, you'd do the you'd train together, but on a Saturday you'd fight together, and it, it was just the, it was just brilliant. Just the I best love it. Years of my life. Okay, I'm going to get you. Uh, there's a, a lot of listeners here in the US, and um, obviously we have Craig Burley out here on ESPN FC, Jay, and um, mm. a few people want to know if you ever worked with Craig or. Oh yeah. <laughs> I used to room, room with Craig. Yeah, room with Craig a few times. Yeah, he's a he's a good he's a good boy, Craig. He's um. Yeah, good player as well. I mean, a really, really good player. So, uh, yeah, I like I like Craig. Got got a lot done. Work with him on Chelsea TV as well. He's a he's a good lad. Who was the best roommate you ever had? We go inside the dressing room, but then we want to know a little bit of that too. Best roommate, well, worst roommate. My, my best mate, my best mate growing up at, at Chelsea was who lived you know a mile down the road from me was Graham Stewart, and he's uh, he's younger than me, but we. we we played the same district team, same county team, the youth team, the Rezzy's first team, under twenty ones. You know, it was, yeah, he was he was my bestie. And did was he there when you were there, Kevin Everton? Graham Stewart. No, no, he, he wasn't. Him. But he's an ambassador of Everton. Uh, Diamond. That's right. That's right. He's a top yeah. top guy, top top yeah. lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he was. He was the one. He, he was he was my best mate, and um, like you know, it's amazing because I played with Graham when I was probably ten, nine, something like that. And you know, you you, you fast forward forty years, and you know, he's still he's he's still one of the guys you, that, that you know I've got on my speed dial. So um, yeah, it's amazing really yeah. to think of that. I ask Kev this question a lot because he still hasn't really answered it. Who does he hate more, Tottenham or Liverpool? <laughs> 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 equal measure, Kev. Equal measure. I've, I have answered it. I have answered it. I have. It's, it's obviously it's only one team. I hate, really, I, obviously, I hate Liverpool. Ninety-nine point nine 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 percent, but I hate Spurs one hundred percent. Oh, I want to know. There's something we can agree on there, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got on Sunday. If you hate more Tottenham, um, West Ham, or Arsenal, I, d I don't hate West Fulham. Ham. I don't, don't hate I, Fulham. I don't hate West Ham. I don't hate Arsenal. I don't hate Fulham. There you go. Boom! It's <laughs> KC celebration. It's what's that? It's you know, no, no, it's, it's just something about look. I know I play for them. I'm a Chelsea fan, right? The biggest game of the season. The two biggest games for me. Two biggest games games of the season. Not necessarily in this order. Spurs at home, Liverpool at home, right? Yeah. And we played Liverpool, and we and it was I think kind of a bit early in the season for us, and and we we, we gave them a game for forty five minutes, then we went down to ten men. We got Spurs on Sunday. Um, I'll be there doing working with Chelsea TV. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't wait. It, but it is that's that's and that's how football should be. Hell, it's healthy rivalry. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I look. I, I expect them to dislike Chelsea as much as we dislike them. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Um, I'm going to get you out on this one. KC can play too. I know what his answers will be, but I have to do a little bit of a Chelsea versus Arsenal. Go for um, it. Okay. So, Burkamp or Zola? I know you'll be honest. <clears throat> I love that he's even thinking about it, KC. <laughs> it's Burkamp. <laughs> Burkamp. All right. Mourinho or Wenger? Oh, you know, you, you, yeah. He chose Mourinho over Wenger, Casey. All right. Yeah, I know. I know. Mourinho, right. yeah. All right. This one, this one's interesting. John Terry or Tony Adams? 
Oh, it's like asking which one of my children do I love the most, isn't it? No, no, it's it's John Terry. I think John Terry is the best English centre half of I've I've ever seen. But I'll tell you a story about about Tony Adams. The first time I played, I don't know. You might have played Kev. First time I played at, at, at Highbury. Um, can't remember what year, 90 or 1991. And I was marking Tony Adams on corners. And, you know, I never played against him before. And I couldn't, I, I was shocked at the size of him. That was the first thing that, yeah. that, that, that shocked me. And so I'm marking him on corners. And the first corner that comes across, as he's let, as I've tried to jump, I've headed his hip. That's how high he got. He literally, he's let. And as I've got to jump, I, I've, headed, I've headed his stomach. I don't know. I, I, honestly, that I thought, my God, you, you're an absolute monster. He was, he was. I love Tony Adams, brilliant, but it's John Terry for me. Okay, and and the last one, only because of some of our listeners might not remember it, but a lot do. Stamford Bridge back in the day was also a parking lot, if we remember correctly. <laughs> I mean, do you remember that whole scene? That wasn't the shed end. That was the other side. I was talking about this the other day, right, Jay? That. I mean, the ambulance was there. I don't know whose cars. Lots of, hold on, no, no, don't create lots of space. Lots of space for, for people, for ambulances. To, what are you laughing at? <laughs> lots of space for ambulances to get round. Oh, you, you, you didn't have that hybrid. Oh, okay. If there's a big disaster, you couldn't get round the ground. Chelsea, you could. <laughs> Chelsea was a safer ground. <laughs> it, it was a roundabout. It was a roundabout. <laughs> a roundabout. <laughs> quality, quality. I know, I know. Quality, quality. I love that. That's my ground. That's the first ground I went to as a kid. That's my. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Okay. Highbury, Highbury was a brilliant football guy. I loved Highbury. One of the. One of the <laughs> you know, it reminds me like Aston Villa. There aren't many of them left, you know. Aston Villa, Fulham, uh, you know, the old so Everton. There aren't many left. Don't you miss like yeah. with the old FA Cup semis at Villa Park and. You know, all the old stadiums, it was just, there was a yeah. lot of tradition about that. The, the joy of then going to Wembley and playing um, at Wembley and stuff like that. Well, listen, we've kept you over an hour. Uh, fine, we fine. haven't even really gone deep fun. into the dressing room, have we? There's so much more. We're going to have to do a we'll to get John again. <laughs> Yeah, next year. Do, do the yeah. lock-in version. We'll we, can, we really can swear. <laughs> oh, look, this is very cheeky for yeah. Newman. Job, Jogba or Campbell before you go. <laughs> Jogba or Campbell? I, I, never, I never played against Jogba, but I played against Kevin, right? And I know how tough that was. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us. You're always such oh, a pleasure, good friend guys. of the it's show. Been, and it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Sometimes it's just nice to kind of... Uh, for you your know, time. Great to you, mate. Uh, listen, guys, have, uh, listen, have a fabulous Christmas and a, and, and a happy new year and... Look, ho hopefully we'll see you uh, at Stamford Bridge and I'll be the, the Emirates as well, hopefully very, very soon. And, and this mess is all over. So That sounds like a great Fingers. plan. And until nice then, one, Jay. Jay. See you and your family, mate. Take good care. Same to you, bud. Take Listen, care, everyone. As you know, everybody, it's, it's always Arsenal on here. Come on, you gutters. <laughs>